Good morning. My name is Christine Lee, and it's wonderful to share with you. And I thank Pastor Howard for asking me today. Let me just start off with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for life, for health, for this wonderful country, to worship you and learn, learn from your word. Thank you for saving us from our sins. Speak through me today that we all might turn to you and be motivated to share and serve others. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. I serve with Urban Promise Toronto. It's an organization that serves those in Toronto community housing, that is, low-income housing, and we provide Bible studies and mentoring through after-school programs, March breaks, and summer camp. We believe that the hours between 3 to 6 are when children are most vulnerable, when the parents are either at work or when the sun is bright and the kids are out playing in the neighborhood. So we have after-school programs where children come, they play, they have a lot of fun, they get tutoring for school, and most importantly, they learn about God and how to worship Him. We have March break camps and all-day summer camps. Here's a picture from last year's March break camp, and we were just in a completely different world back then. A year ago for March break, we brought the kids to the Royal Ontario Museum, and it was completely packed. It was so crowded that our entire camp got in completely free because there was just no way to count anyone. In a time of social distancing right now, it seems like we were in a completely different world. For many of our kids, the summer camp is the highlight of their year. We have to teach, we teach them the Bible, to worship, to dance, and they go on wonderful trips around Toronto. The best part is when they come in the doors, they are loved completely with the love of Jesus Christ. We light up when we see them, we joke with them, and we have lots of fun with them which is an experience I believe every child should have. And we're in their lives, and it's a great joy to do this. As I was writing this message, a girl who was in um, part of our Urban Promise camp is now 16, and she messaged our group. Her mother had left her when she was little, and she was raised by a woman in our community. She had a really difficult childhood, and that situation was only partially redeemed by the community coming together. Anyways, she messaged us because she's working on her school project, and she doesn't have any pictures of herself when she was young. She has no pictures of herself under the age of 10. And as she messaged her, her, we were able to give her loads of pictures. I have pictures when she was five playing on her front porch, when she was six at our mom's group, tons of pictures of her as a little girl in our camp. And so it's amazing to have a long history with these kids and to be in their lives. It's almost like being part of an extended family. Now, we have Urban Promise all over the world. There's Urban Promise Vancouver, Miami, Arkansas. There's Urban Promise in Kenya, Malawi, Nigeria. And the reason I'm telling you this, I'm so excited to tell you this, but there is an Urban Promise Ottawa in the works. God planted the seed in Ottawa over five years ago, and there's been a lot of thinking and planning for it to start. The woman heading it up has worked for years in low-income neighborhoods in Toronto and loves Jesus very much. So prior to COVID-19, we had hoped that it would take off in a small way in the summer, but we're not so sure now. But if you can, please remember UP Ottawa in your prayers. I believe God can and will do wonderful things through this ministry. And if you want, ever want to come to UB Toronto on a short-term mission, on a tour or anything, please contact me. Pastor Howard will give you my contact number. So, I was told that you are going through Ephesians, and I wanted to use Ephesians as a backdrop to share about compassion and action in ministry. And I thought Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 10, would be a great foundation for this. Let's read Ephesians 2, 1 to 10 together. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you follow the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who, has, who is now at work in those who are disobedient. 
All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Paul writes here that we were dead in our transgressions. We gratified the cravings of our sinful nature and followed those desires and thoughts. We were by nature children of wrath. We were complete sinners and dead in our sin. We were in rebellion to God and we deserved death. Now, people don't really like to say that, even though it's right here in the Bible. Many Christians today that say that people in this world are basically good. I mean, who am I to judge others, right? We're mostly good. My coworker who doesn't know Christ, she's a nice person. She's kind. She hasn't done any big crimes against society. They live a reasonably good life. And if the good a person does outweighs the bad in this world, who am I to speak, judge another person or say that they are sinners? How can I speak to what goes on in the heart of another person? But the Bible paints a really different story. We are dead in our transgressions and sins. The Bible uses a lot of other terms, like we were blind, we were a slave to sin, we were a lover of darkness, we are sick, we are lost, we are an alien, we are a stranger, a foreigner, a child of wrath, we're under the power of darkness. And so there's no softening that picture. And if you think that we are okay without Christ, that really is a false sense of security. And as the saying goes, if you think that you're only slightly ill, then you just get an aspirin. But if you think that you are dying, then you passionately seek out a cure. You take this seriously. And if you think that your sin is not hideous to God, you take it easy with approaching, with approaching God. But if you think that the wages of sin is death, then you approach God a little differently. But this passage is not about an angry God who calls us sinners. It is about a God rich in mercy. And because of his great love for us, he made us alive with Christ. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And if we believe and repent, we are raised with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly realms. Our sins are forgiven. This is the goodness of God. Rich in mercy providing the solution for our sins, doing it all, God saves us. Today on Mother's Day, you can consider a mother-child relationship. There may be imperfect moms out there, but in general, you don't need to make yourself lovable to your mother. In Romans 5, 8 says that God shows his love for us, his great love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's the greatness of God's love and mercy to us. God loves us while we are still full of sin. We didn't do a thing to earn his love. And God, who is rich in mercy, solved a huge sin problem for us. He provided the entire solution to our sin problem. And so now being saved, we can, we are able to do good works. Of course, note the order. You do not do good works, and that makes you saved. No, you are saved by the grace and mercy of God, and that leads you to do good works. God was, uh, Paul was keen to write, you being saved, it's a gift. So no one can boast about that. And because we are saved, we can do good works. In fact, because we're saved by grace, we are created in Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us. 
And so this is the, the thing, to live our lives and miss this great purpose to which we were designed for, that would be truly awful. And I don't want that for any of us. So this leads me to the topic of compassion and care for those in need. With Ephesians 2, 1 to 10 as a foundation to our thinking, the confidence to identity, we can serve others. Knowing that we are sinners and saved by God leads us to serve others compassionately. Why? Because we know that we ourselves are completely undeserving of anything at all. God saved me. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says, For who sees anything differently in you? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? I remember that I was nothing. I was dead in my transgressions and full of sin. And yet God took mercy on me. I work with those in need in Toronto. Particularly, my focus is on the moms in the community. And not once do I go in thinking I am or I earned something better than them. They tell me their stories, and it's an honor to hear their stories and to be allowed in their lives. They tell me about difficult childhoods, unstable jobs, inconsistent meals, lack of discipline and nurture, and how these things have shaped their lives. And I think about myself. I have never worried about my next meal. I have never struggled with getting a printer at home to do homework. I've never dragged piles and piles of clothes to the laundromat. In fact, I had the opposite childhood. I've had the opposite life. If I had a project to do, I was driven to the library. Yes, we went to the library to research back then in the good old days. When was the last time a teen went nowadays to the library to research? I was exposed to music and books and authors. Even when I see drug addicted people in my community, I remember that I had mentors who guided me along the way. People who noticed me. There was nothing I have that I did not receive. And best of all, when I was completely dead in my transgressions with nothing to offer, God chose me and drew me to himself. He died my, for my sin and revealed himself to me in a way that I couldn't resist or deny. Jonathan Edwards once said, You contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. We can give compassion to others and serve them, not at all from a sense of duty, but out of a deep recognition that we were sinners, saved by the goodness of God. There is absolutely no place for pride or an inflated sense of self-importance when we consider this fact. If God can be rich in mercy to me, how can I not consider the person around me, regardless of their life circumstance? If you keep remembering, I was a sinner, God saved me, this is a constant reminder of God's goodness to me, and then I can be more compassionate to others. Ephesians 4, 23, 32, I mean, says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Second, knowing that we were sinners and saved by God leads us to serve without fear and with great confidence. So 1 John 4, 18 says, there's no fear in love because perfect love casts out fear. And so I can be vulnerable to others and serve with confidence. I can speak boldly to my friends, knowing that I am saved by grace and loved deeply by God. You can love generously. So say you want to make yourself vulnerable to your neighbor. We're in quarantine now. And so say you go write a little note to your neighbor and leave it by the door. Or maybe you buy some groceries for someone out of a deep love for Christ. Now, suppose, rather than feeling touched by your good gesture, suppose your neighbor thinks that you are strange and very weird and slams the door to your face. Maybe they rip out your note, rip up your note because they had another bad experience of somebody else who had witnessed to them very harshly and with great judgment. 
Or maybe they say, no, thank you, because they don't trust the stuff that you bought them, that you so carefully chose for them because, you know, COVID-19. Are you defeated? No, not at all. You recall how many times in your past when you were a sinner, you too slammed the door on a Christian's face. That was me before. God loved me and didn't give up on me. Mind you, this is a case where it's good to have Christian friends around you to support you and encourage you to keep on loving others. And so we keep on going, full of confidence that God is good and rich in love and mercy. And so I can be too. God can make our, we can make ourselves vulnerable to others. We can be confident to give and serve generously. In fact, you can be so confident of God's goodness that you can even give generously of your stuff without fear. We don't have to worry about our stuff. We are confident in God's rich mercy to care for all our needs. Psalms 37 is all about how God's people will be protected, will be watched over, and will be held by God. In fact, Psalms 37, 25 says, I have been young and now I'm old and yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. That is a great confidence. We can be confident even in our struggles and difficulties. Normally we have struggles and we have struggles every day and we bring these struggles before God. But now COVID-19 is huge, but we had struggles before this pandemic, and now we have difficulties upon difficulties. But with all these struggles, we remember God, who is powerful even to raise us from the dead, from, to raise us from the dead and, and to give us new life, full, that he is so full of grace, love, and mercy. So we can trust God with all our difficulties. He saved us before, he can do it again. As I write this, I'm reeling from the difficulties and sorrows in this world. COVID numbers rise every day and I think I check the numbers way too much. I wrote this um, message on Thursday, April 23rd. And just three days ago on Monday, one of the moms that I served with at Urban Promise overdosed with drugs and she died on Tuesday morning. The community is devastated, angry, and sad. Her death comes exactly three years minus one day of another mother in our community who also died of a drug-related cause on April 22nd, 2017. In fact, they lived in the same building. Now you would think the overwhelming response to this would be sadness. But this week, when I spoke to the mothers, there was anger and frustrations. The anger felt in the community is that drug overdose is completely preventable. It just did not need to happen. We are angry at the works of Satan. Or, to use the words in Ephesians 2, we are angry at the ways of the world and and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is at work in those who are disobedient. We are angry at the temptations coming at us, causing us to gratify the cravings of our sin nature. The mother that died this past week did not have young children depending on her. But the mother that died three years ago did, and it was awful. The family was separated. Some went to aunts and uncles, and one went to the grandmother. The family unit was scattered. And it is horrible and sad, and our community is angry at the pull of the sin nature. But we have hope. In fact, we have great confidence. God is truly rich in mercy, and he has great love for us. I believe he has great love for you and for me. And if we spend a moment considering his great love, we know that he has great love not just for us, but for the people in our community, the poor in our community, and even those who rebel against God. God's love is that great and rich and merciful. And we can have confidence in God even when we feel like a failure. How can, some of you might be thinking, how can I serve God when I can barely serve myself? Why do other people seem to have such a great life? 
I see pictures all over Facebook. People are baking their own bread during quarantine. Their children are wrapping sushi. Others are wearing masks and handing out food to the poor. And we think, what am I doing? I barely have time. My regular responsibilities overwhelm me. I serve as a missionary, and believe me, even I fall into the comparison game, and I feel like I am not serving enough. I am not doing enough. My coworker has dropped off a lot of food in a lot of buildings, and he does this all the time. My good friend brought an elderly couple to Christ just right before the nursery home closed its doors. That gentleman passed away, but now he is saved for all eternity, and the wife is still alive right now and loving Jesus. These are great stories, and I'm thrilled for them. But sometimes I wonder, when was the last time I led somebody to Christ? And of course, many parents right now are feeling every day a sense of failure. They're thinking, I need to work from home. But when I work, I'm neglecting the children. And when I spend time with the children, the house is a mess and the food that we eat is junk. And it's like spinning three plates on a stick. If one plate stops spinning, it will fall and break. So you have to get to every single plate before it slows down just to speed it up again. And the more plates you have, the more frantically you dash from plate to plate to keep it all going. And it's impossible. But when we see our failures through the eyes of Ephesians, we see that our salvation is a grace. It's a gift so that no one can boast. We are no longer overwhelmed by our failures. In fact, we can be overwhelmed by the mercy of God. Maybe we think that we're unworthy. Maybe we're just being humble and say that I'm not good enough. But that is a straight up lie. By thinking this way, we are ignoring the goodness of God the great love of God and his immeasurably measurable riches of his kindness to us through Jesus Christ. So with Ephesians 2 as our backdrop, we can serve with others. We can reach out with compassion in our actions without fear of our failures. Because if we make mistakes, it's okay. God's grace and mercy can cover that too. I love this story of Martin Luther and his friend Philip Melanchthon. Philip and Martin were good friends, and Martin Luther was a Protestant reformer. Philip was gentle, tender-hearted, and kind. Martin was bold and feisty. Now Martin had just stood before the courts, and he was asked to denounce his teachings, and he, and he refused. The church wanted to kill him. He was a hunted man, and so now he was hiding out in one of Frederick Elector's spare castles. Martin was hiding, and Philip was in Wittenberg trying to control the crowds. Rome was upset at all the protesters on one hand, and on the other hand, the protesters themselves were taking things too far, going the opposite extreme. And so poor sweet Philip was caught in the middle. He just didn't know what to do. And so Martin wrote to Philip these words. He said, be a sinner and sin boldly. That's how people often misquote this quote. But the real quote is, be a sinner and sin boldly, but believe and rejoice in Christ even more boldly. Luther wasn't telling Philip Melanchthon not to try to sin, to try to sin, some, as some people misinterpret this quote, but he was saying that you should forget about trying not to sin, because in the end, this is going to be impossible. We will make mistakes. We will fail. Luther wanted Philip Melanchthon to understand that in all we do, we will doubtless sin because we are sinners. But if our faith is in Christ, who has defeated sin and paid for our sins on the cross, we are redeemed. Luther wanted Melanchthon not to be so scared, but simply to lead, even if he couldn't do it perfectly. Many of us might be scared to reach out to our friends. We might be very scared. When I go into the Urban Promise communities, and if I'm knocking on the door of a new family that I don't know very well, I am always scared. Who am I, I wonder? Why would anyone even care to listen to me? And what if I say the wrong thing? 
What if I say something that is culturally insensitive? But I'm really comforted by Luther's letter to Philip. Yes, I will screw up, I will mess up, and I will sin. But I will go out and do it. And not if, but when I fail, I will rejoice in Christ even more boldly. So isn't Ephesians 2 such an amazing foundation for serving others? You simply cannot mess up so badly. Because at one point, you were far in your sin. You were completely dead and God is still able to do wonderful things in you. St. Therese once said, God's mercy alone brought out everything that is good in me. So knowing that we are sinners saved by God leads us to serve others more compassionately and it leads us to serve others without fear and with great confidence. We do this out of deep recognition that we are sinners saved by the goodness of God. So this is just the basic gospel. And many of us know this. And many of us believe that we are sinners and saved by God's goodness and mercy. Unfortunately, many Christians believe this gospel truth in a way that William Wilberforce calls cultural Christianity and not authentic Christianity. That is, many people believe this gospel and use it as a moral guide when discussing things like hope in death or stealing or lying or cheating. And they know they should go to church and be in good standing with others. But when it comes to real life, practically like thinking about your child's future, the hope might be in education or jobs. Or when it comes to health or success or wealth or possessions, people think, well, that's my business. I will work hard in those areas and using my own methods. And when it comes to serving compassionately those in need, I will serve maybe because I ought to do it because it's the right thing to do. Or maybe even worse, I will do it to get the approval of others. Those reasons will not last. To really believe this gospel is the only motivation to care for others. It's the only way to push through the discouragement when things go wrong, when we need to make ourselves vulnerable or when people criticize us. It enables us to trust God for the end result, even when things look completely hopeless. And it helps you to serve with all your energy as though the work is for God himself. We would just burn out if we cared for others for the wrong reasons. We need to keep remembering that we were dead in our sins, hopeless, but that God saved us. And we are saved by faith and created for good works. This COVID-19 is a time where people are naturally thinking inward. And that's just human nature. Protect yourself and your family. But I want to challenge you to think outwardly during this time. Maybe it's time to pray for others and call on those who might be alone or send them an email during this time. COVID-19 is a great ex excuse to be checking in, to be calling up old high school friends or reach out where you normally don't reach out. When things are normal and good in time of peace and prosperity and calmness, we don't tend to think about others. But now, this is our chance. I want to encourage you to think. Think what good works God might call you to out of gratitude for this great salvation that we have. If you're shopping for yourself, can you shop for someone else as well? You can just call up anyone. One elderly man told me he was so touched that someone called, offered to shop for him. He didn't need it at all, but he just, just knowing that he was cared for made him feel good. So I encourage you to check on your neighbors. Renew the art of letter writing or card writing. I think that if you spend some time thinking about your friends and the circle around you that God gave you, he will give you ideas. And when COVID-19 is over, reach out to those in need. You're welcome to come to serve at Urban Promise Toronto. Or maybe you want to serve at Urban Promise Ottawa as well. 
Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for saving us from our sins. When we were dead in our sins and transgressions, de deserving death and living deserving of wrath, but you chose us to save us and you made us alive with Christ. Thank you, God, for doing that. And on this Mother's Day, we recognize that you are father and mother to us, loving us, caring for us, and preparing us for a life with purpose. We don't want to keep this great salvation to ourselves. Lord, use us. Use us as a church. Use us in our families. We want to share your love with those around us. So God, please show us how. Thank you. And in Jesus' most precious name I pray. Amen.